Welcome to today's video. My name is Rob and in today's episode we are going to look at how the Soviet Union actually ran. It took up a large space on the globe, but I don't know enough about it. So, hopefully we can learn a little bit today. The totalitarian terror of Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin was so repulsive that the Communist Party itself denounced it after Stalin's death, but when he died, nothing about the Soviet system legally changed. The USSR had always claimed to be a democratic state, so then, with Stalin gone, was it? Did the Soviet government report to its millions of people? And mm. as it officially denounced the idea of having a state at all, how did the Soviet Union actually work? See, all I know about Stalin really is the fact that he had his, his statues and his heads all around the Soviet Union, but that's only from watching Bold and Bankrupt. Uh, his YouTube channel, but a lot of these countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, they have tore down the heads now of, of Stalin, but that's all I really know about him. So hopefully I'm going to learn a little bit more because it's, it is fascinating and it's almost a, a complete world away from what I'm used to in the United Kingdom. Well, the territory of the Soviet Union more or less Vast. matched that of the former Russian Empire, but it was internally divided into 15 republics, having grown from an original four. Officially called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, it existed from the end of the chaotic Russian Civil War until 1991, when its constituent parts became independent countries. Before that though, on paper at least, they had all come together voluntarily. The first four republics, the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, the Transcaucasian SFSR, and the Belarusian SSR, had all agreed to sign the Treaty on the Creation of the Soviet Union, but the latter three were puppets of Russia, led by Vladimir Lenin and his Bolshevik party. Oh, yeah, heads they of had Lenin been created as well. during the Russian Civil War, after the Bolsheviks had crushed local independence movements, and the freedom guaranteed to each nationality was more a matter of theatre, or as Lenin might put it, democracy, rather than representation. I think this image back here sums up the sort of the things that you feel the propaganda had. So you see happy faces, you know, you see the hard work. Quite often you see the murals on walls and you see um, the soldiers, you see the workers, you see, and it, but everyone is working hard for the greater good. And I think it's almost, a, it's, it's almost propaganda, right? That, you know, you work hard, you will be rewarded, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it was probably a bit of a lie, right? Surely, because you work hard and you probably don't get what you deserve. Theatre, or as Lenin might put it, democracy, rather than representation. Eventually, more ethnicities got the same treatment. Russian Central Asia was made into five republics for the Uzbeks, Turkmens, Tajiks, Kazakhs, and Kyrgyz. Transcaucasia was reorganized as Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Moldavia were forcibly incorporated during World War Forcefully. II. Forcefully. By the mid-50s, the number of republics had stabilized at 15. Each had a Supreme Soviet, or Supreme Council, a parliament in Western terms, and each was also subdivided into increasingly smaller and more specific districts with their own Soviets. The Russian SFSR, being the largest republic by a mile, was the most complicated, and it contained about a dozen so-called autonomous Soviet socialist republics centered on local nationalities within Russia. A few also existed in the other republics. Power, though, was really concentrated at the very top of two parallel hierarchies. The ethnically based republics existed to maintain the illusion that the Soviet state stood for international worker solidarity. In practice, centralized government bureaucracy and the Bolsheviks, who were renamed the Communist Party, ruled the USSR. That system, developed by Lenin, is usually called Soviet democracy or democratic centralism. The USSR purported to be a socialist dictatorship of the proletariat, a stepping stone stage in the left-wing revolutionary ideology, Marxism. In it, workers, having seized the means of production, end capitalism and use a temporary socialist system to create a fully stateless, classless society. 
a communist utopia. But Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto over 70 years before the Soviet Union was created, and Lenin added his own ideas to the original plan. He championed the idea of communist leaders taking charge as a vanguard party that could wage class warfare on behalf of the workers. Accordingly, the key tenets of democratic centralism were the forbidding of dissent to democratically made decisions and strict respect for authority. They, they talk about uh, a lot on democracy, but when you see constant pictures of, for example, Lenin and whatnot on on posters and flags and things, that doesn't scream democracy, does it really? Uh, just imagining having Rishi Sunak on a flag. And that does not scream democracy, does it? it it's, it's basically this guy is in power. You look at North Korea having statues and things of, of the leaders, King John un and all that lot, that doesn't scream democracy. So I think the, the, the democratic part of it, like it's saying, is almost a facade. It's, it's trying to make people believe that it's democratic, but it's not. Hmm. Uh, you see, obviously, like I said, the workers, it's all about the workers, you know, we're all equal. You're not all equal, are you? Because the people at the top always get the most. The biggest people and the strongest people always get more than the weaker people. Lenin died before he could fully implement his vision, and after him the USSR reached its totalitarian zenith under Joseph Stalin, Stalin. who ruled as a one-man dictator. That was unacceptable to the Greater Communist Party, but the smart ones kept quiet about it during Stalin's life, and the rest were brutally purged. Post-Stalin, though, the Communist Party reasserted collective control and returned to something more like Lenin's vision, and that lasted until the Soviet Union's fall. The two parallel institutions, the government and the Communist Party, were organized into pyramid hierarchies. In theory, they were meant to be ran from the bottom up, with the lower bodies allocating power to the smaller, higher ones, but in practice the official government was subservient to the party, and power in the Communist Party flowed from the top down. It Which is, literally, so I think what this diagram shows, where it's working from the bottom to the top, that is democracy, right? So if you look in, in the UK and most... Western civilizations or democratic civilizations, you know, the, the people at the top are voted in for by the people at the bottom because they're there to run, you know, to, to work on behalf of the people. So that's, yeah, that's what it should be. However, clearly, um, and, I, and I, let's be honest, you can probably see that with old Vlad Putin at the moment, but it's clearly the other way around, isn't it? You know, the, the people at the top decide everything and it's not really democra democratic, is it? Its executive arm, the Politburo and the Secretariat, headed by the General Secretary of the Communist Party, controlled the government. The General Secretary was the de facto leader of the Soviet Union, and only the party's central committee could potentially dismiss him or other members of the Politburo. But of course, the Politburo's members generally determined who was in the central committee. <laughs> All that said, in principle, democratic centralism allowed for discussion and debate, just with the losers being bound to adopt the views of the majority, and the Soviet government was elected. The largest part of it was the Supreme Soviet of the whole Soviet Union, a parliament which convened in the capital, Moscow. It had two houses with 750 deputies each. Both houses, the Soviets of the Union and the Nationalities, were elected, and the upper house represented specific ethnicities, checking the Russian majority. Which sounds all well and good, the catch was how those elections worked. <laughs> While everyone in the USSR could vote, every candidate for office had to be vetted and approved by the Communist Party, and then the approved candidate would be the only option listed on a ballot. Voting was also done publicly. It wasn't technically illegal to fill out a ballot in private, but it was an obvious act of dissent and very rarely done. You can look at it now, can't you? That there's been uh, people that have opposed Vladimir Putin and, and have been an opposition to him. But something always seems to happen to whoever opposes Vladimir Putin, right? 
So, you know, yes, yes, you can stand for election, but you probably won't make it to the day of election in the first place. And and in this sense, you know, yes, people have to vote, right? Or, or the voting is there. But it's frowned upon if you do it in private. So people want to see what you're going to vote for. And if there is a fear, which I, I you would assume there is, there's a sort of, a, when you go to fill out that bit of paper, there's a fear. And therefore you fight for survival, right? It's that survival instinct where you just sort of do as you're told. And so it's more of an illusion of democracy, an illusion of free will, when really you're just doing as you're told and, and just for a safe life. Unsurprisingly, prospective candidates routinely won 99% of the vote. Being elected to a Soviet was a way of rewarding party lackeys and continuing the theater act of representation, mm -hmm. not of holding anyone to account. There were over 40,000 of them across the USSR by the 1970s, though, elected at every level from individual village councils to the Supreme Soviet itself. The Communist Party also organized all across the country in the form of primary party units at virtually every factory, farm, or other business in the Soviet Union. The PPUs were made up of loyal but ordinary party members who were responsible for ensuring their enterprise met state-set economic targets. They were usually small bodies with a minimum size of three members, but they were the building blocks of the larger party. The PPUs organized into larger district committees, which formed about 150 regional committees, which then elected the republic-level party congresses, which together elected the all-union party congress. Again, though, in line with the unity demanded by democratic centralism, the job of all those organizations was to approve and acclaim the decisions made higher up the ranks. They voted to approve what they were told to approve, and the All-Union Party Congress gathered only every five years. That's basically what I was saying. So it's that illusion of democracy. But those, those say, three people in businesses and whatnot that formed a group, they would be people picked that they knew would vote for the party that, you know, that the current party, and therefore it's all about power. It's that illusion of democracy. Leaving the Central Committee and the Politburo free to exercise all of its theoretical power. The Supreme Soviet also only met twice per year for about a week's worth of work. In reality, its functions were exercised by its much smaller committees, the Presidium and Council of Ministers. The Council basically being a cabinet appointed by the Supreme Soviet, its chairman was technically the Prime Minister of the USSR, and the Presidium being the body responsible for choosing what the Supreme Soviet would be voting on, and inevitably approving. Mm -hmm. It functioned as sort of a collective head of state. Both were controlled by the Politburo and Secretariat because, by choosing the candidates, they decided who sat in the Supreme Soviet. Was the Soviet Union really a democracy then? No. Certainly, it was a true democracy, by its own definition anyway. <laughs> really, it operated as a state where government institutions existed primarily to legitimize the actions of one political party. Marxism-Leninism, supposed to destroy class altogether, ended up creating an exclusive, self-perpetuating bureaucracy that ruled over the masses it claimed to represent. Not that Russians had really been better off before their revolution. To find out how the old czars of the Russian Empire managed their vast state before Lenin came along, obviously, Another you should video. check out the video yeah. on how the Russian Empire actually worked to the left. Go check out Look Back History. But I think there's 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 a there's a saying, isn't there? It's who you know rather than what you know. And as I said, again, it's that illusion of democracy. But what it really was was you pick your friends. So if if I'm in charge, I would pick below me my friends because you know that your friends are gonna vote for you. And it's all about power, it's all about staying in power. And as I said, yeah, technically, it's a democracy, right? Technically, it's a democracy. However, it's a democracy that is heavily influenced in your favour, and therefore, it's it's an illusion. That, that's what it is, right? It's an illusion. It's not It's not real. You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to explain, but it's an illusion.
you know, and and if you have your mates by your side, nothing changes and you and you guarantee yourself will stay in power. But, you know, this whole getting rid of a class system, it's not really, though, is it? Because you still got the people that have and the people that have not. And they they have these images, don't they? You, I said you always see these images and you saw them in this where you have all different people, all, all working class people, not what they would call it, but of different occupations standing together as one. They, they want to create that. We're working together to create something better. But if there's any other ideas, they're quickly shut down. I think it's fascinating. It really, really is. And if you were around during uh, the Soviet times, please let me know what your what your experiences were and what you thought of it. But thank you so much for watching. I do love learning uh, and YouTube is fantastic for, for being able to do that. So thank you so much for joining me. Please do make sure you like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time.